Well, hello there. Hello there and welcome. It's your buddy, Admiral Teague, and I'm here to show you some of the crazy misinformation the people from New Trek are putting out there to try to deceive us about some of the greatest movies ever made. But first, if you could, could you hit those like and follow buttons for me? Keep you in touch with what's going on. Maybe hit that notification bell. I'd appreciate it. Now for the video. In this terrible video, we're going to find out that they will do anything and say anything. It doesn't matter how untrue to try to get Star Trek to seem like it was always bad. Because Star Trek is bad now, we have to make it look like Star Trek was always bad. Because Star Trek has problems now, we should make it look like it always has problems. Since Star Trek is never, ever edited or redrafted properly now, we're going to go after older scenes that don't have editing and redrafting problems and attack them. At any rate, this is 10 dumbest things in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. It has almost 10,000 thumbs up, but conspicuously 634 thumbs down, which is a huge number if you think about it. All right. Well, I have turned the speed up to maximum pretty much on this recording so that we don't have to endure 17 full minutes of it. But let's hear what kind of lies they tell. And then I'll shuttle through their points without really letting us have to hear the entire drivelous reason why these untrue things have merit. Not too many people would argue with me when I say that The Wrath of Khan is the best Star Trek movie ever, but it's imperfect. But you're about to argue with yourself in the way that most human endeavors are. This is unsurprising, given that when director Nicholas Meyer was offered the film, there was shades of the motion picture, but no. He was always going to be bad because it came after a movie that was pretty good, but not as good as this one. I whatever. Workable script. In fact, three different scripts had been developed. The Omega System, the Genesis Project, and the new Star Trek. So my You can see how it probably was mostly the Genesis Project that got made. But to sit there and make these ridiculous arguments about how these things don't really mean much because they were, you know, uh, not used, that's stupid. They had three contingencies for three possibilities. They were able to hit the ground running with their next movie when that movie was scheduled to start shooting because they had fully developed three ideas. Meyer and the producer identified all the bits they liked from the scripts, and Meyer wrote his first draft of a new script in just under two weeks. Title. All right, so they had script treatments and he was able to complete a new script in about two weeks. They're leaving out the fact that he watched every episode of the original series to get an idea of what he was writing. It's called research. The Undiscovered Country. Well, actually they retitled it to The Vengeance of Khan, but then they retitled it again to The Wrath of Khan before release. So they really couldn't make up their minds. Many. So that was a bad thing that they tested different titles. Many revisions followed, but time was wasting and money was tight. The script and the- You see the tone here? Everything is really dumb. Resulting film were of astounding quality for such a time crunch project, but it- It's a miracle the movie was any good. In that hurry, a fair amount of dumb things did slip through the cracks, so- This is New Trek telling us about how dumb old Trek is. Here he is, here's our host. Who, who is so this? With all that history in mind, and with our love of this film firmly established, Oh, Bree Beecher, your name is a gift. We're going to have some fun with that. Let's have a bit of fun while we look at the 10 dumbest things that happened in Star Trek Wrath of Khan. Number All right, she's into having fun too. Let's see how long this lasts. Let's see. Reliance, weak password. Now, this was probably weak as far as passwords go, but her justification for it is pretty ridiculous. Uh, this one I'm going to let you hear because it's just kooky. Number 10, Reliance Weak Password. The prefix code is a good idea for thwarting a hostile takeover of a starship, but a code of only five numbers is in the range of your upper end bicycle combination lock. I didn't have a bank card with a pin code for another 10 years after this movie. And, uh, five numbers is enough for that. Uh, that's like... I don't know, 90,000 combinations? 90,000 possible combinations. Have you ever looked at- Wow. That bank of switches Spock flips to input the code? There are only 10 switches. So what? Switches, one per number from one to nine and zero, and each switch stays flipped after he uses it. Thus, each number can only be used once per code. This means- He has a foot pedal. 
No prefix numbers like 16303 or 01701. I just answered that question. He, he has a foot pedal or he can reset them. If he flips them the other way, it repeats the number. We don't know how it works. You, you seem to know how it works, though. Uh, okay, so we are assuming things. Let's go to the next dump. Very tippy top of the ship's saucer, and with engineering in the cigar shaped engineering secondary hall, there is no way that the bridge is en route to sickbay. So. That's ridiculous because we have a lot of implication that the bridge and sick bay are very close to each other. And the saucer section is where the habitable and more pleasant areas of the ships are, like your quarters. Your quarters aren't in the cigar shaped uh, drive section of the Enterprise. Why then does the turbo lift bring Scotty carrying the mortally wounded cadet Peter Preston to the bridge ever since? Maybe it's because it's his nephew and he's messed up over it. Did you ever think of that? Feature. The movie opened. Fans have either been crying in outrage over this or offering rationalizations and just. Having an in-world explanation is, is, is not making an excuse. Uh, there are several viable in-world explanations. This movie uh, is one of the best movies ever made and certainly the best Star Trek movie. It has a moment here and a moment there that make you go, hmm. But you know what? It's, there's very, very ample in-world explanations that make sense. It doesn't break the movie that Scotty does this. Specifications for it. The damage caused the turbo lifts to malfunction. Uh, Scotty was so grief-stricken that he blah, blah, blah. Logically, they could have had Kirk step out of the turbo lift on his way to sickbay and find... Logic. <laughs> Do you hear this? The new truck people are giving me logic. Scotty with Preston in a line of wounded trying to get into sickbay. But then the audience... All right, um, I'm going to say something that seemed to me obvious from the movie. Maybe it wasn't obvious to the uh, agendized host here who's taking apart one of the greatest movies ever made as though it was done very, very badly, very, very quickly, and it's a miracle that there's anything good about it. Um, Scotty is grief-stricken. Scotty is not uh, just helping out some other crewman. It's his nephew. And also, the implication here is, when we see these explosions, they're pretty intense. And it looks like the Enterprise takes the beating of all beatings. And while there's a bunch of people in sick bay messed up, the implication here is either you made it or you didn't. And very few people of the whole who were affected were people who ended up wounded. Most people didn't make it or were okay. And a lot of these people were okay because of the actions of Peter Preston, Scotty's nephew. Might have been anticipating such a sight en route to McCoy, whereas the door's opening to this horror was indeed a shock. So... So it improved the movie. Therefore, because other people have done things that were similar that didn't work, we're going to call out this instance where it did. That's the reality. It's only there for a punch in the gut dramatic effect, even though it makes zero sense. It doesn't make zero sense. It takes a couple of seconds to process. Shocking? Yeah, absolutely. Dumb? Definitely. Number eight, Kirk and Bone. I, I don't know where you could get off calling it dumb because a Starfleet officer heroically giving their life to save other Starfleet officers is supposed to be what Star Trek is all about. If you think Peter Preston's sacrifice and the resulting confusion and chaos afterwards are dumb, you don't know Star Trek. Bones both blow it. The film's story forces Kirk to catch the idiot ball in order to show him as old and worn out and in desperate need to get his mojo back, which we can accept to a point, but it does go overboard in this regard and does Bones dirty in the process. Upon Say the people who have a robot ghost upload of Picard getting ageistly yelled at by people, even though it's only three years old. This is coming from the same source, ladies and gentlemen. This is some nonsense. Upon discovering Terrell and Chekhov on the regular one space station, Chekhov emotes, Chekhov. Uh, yeah, we're going to go after a beloved Star Trek actor now to try to even up the score. Here we go. Oh, oh sir, it was Khan. We found him on Sethi Alpha 5. He put creatures in our bodies to control our minds. McCoy. Right, okay. So McCoy probably could have done a better job here, but I mean, we're up to four minutes. You got one legit point. It's all right. You're safe now. Check off. They made us say lies, do things, but we beat him. We thought he controlled us, but he did not. The captain was strong. Wait a Vulcan minute, Lieutenant Commander, bad accent. And yeah, I'm also talking about... Beecher, please. 
me because what fun would this be if we didn't do some light teasing? But anyway, Chekhov just explicitly told That is not light teasing. That is a massive put down of beloved Star Trek actor and one of the only living members of the original series. Despicable. All them, the titular space genius had put creatures in their bodies to control their minds. And what is the first reaction to this bombshell? Bones effectively says, it's all good. What? The instant Chekhov admits this, both Kirk and Bones ought to have suspected Khan was behind- They have no context for this. They don't know what's going on. Every word coming out of the Reliant Boys' mouths. Sure, Kirk is focused on the Genesis material. If you watch the movie, Kirk and Spock really give Chekhov and Terrell a look, and they're not too sure. They are sauce of them, but they also don't take their weapons away. The only thing you could say is, like, they couldn't have disarmed him, but, like, if you think that someone might be dangerous to you and they're holding a weapon... I mean, maybe you get the drop of them and say, give me your weapon, but give me your weapon is the kind of thing that's going to set off someone who's gone psycho, Ranger. Call me crazy. Real and finding Dr. Marcus, but he's beyond thick here. And Bones? What excuse does he have? What sort of... Bones' excuse is that he's never seen this before, has limited medical ability on the planet, and is doing the best with what's going on under pressure while they're all under threat of death. They've just been attacked. He's been working on the wounded nonstop. And now he's in another situation. So not knowing what the pathology of the said eel is and the fact that he has all of one and a half minutes to figure out what's going on and is already doing some basic first aid, I think that we can leave Bones alone here for his eyes. Doctor, here's two potential patients say they had foreign creatures placed inside their bodies to control them and doesn't immediately ask how and where and examine the living crap out of them. Kirk's not the one caught with his britches down. McCoy. I'm not sure there's much to this, but okay. McCoy is tripping over the metaphorical pants around his ankles. Number now, here's something that we hadn't noticed, but they had to point it out to us to try to nerf a story that has stood for 40 years, right? Okay, so now we're going to go after Khan. Uh, forget the fact that they can't have their Strange New World show without making constant reference to him by having his member Barry, great, 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 great granddaughter be uh, shipped with Kirk on this stupid Strange New World show. Number seven, the inferior, superior intellect. Khan, Admiral Kirk never bothered to check on our progress. It is only the fact of my genetically engineered intellect that allowed us to survive. My Yes, so what? Much is made of Khan's intellect in the film, but he's dumb as a box of... Really? He's dumb? Rocks throughout, let's be honest. Consider the following. Khan wants Genesis, yet tortures and kills the uncooperative Genesis team instead of sticking eels in them, or instead of taking any of the team with him when he has to leave regular one in order to... All right, listen. The device is built. He's not looking for the information. He actually has most of the information. Uh, he could probably build one himself but we're talking a long process he wants the one that exists right now that's pretty close at hand he also wants a piece of captain kirk everything khan does is logical it is not stupid what he what what the, his course of actions is not dumb this is preposterous to say this to blow kirk to bits i mean yeah i get he's mad but come on he's a super genius next mr superior intellect can't spot the most in plain sight code ever spock says hours would seem like days and then explains the ship's status using all right so this was our clue that we got later if you remember the movie days 12 year olds in the audience could decode that on the fly so why can't khan or his crew of fellow superhuman or savik for that matter yes khan has activated his ahab obsession power up and he's phaser focused on harpooning his white whale kirk i don't know um when i took my nephew to this movie uh he's really smart he was 12 he didn't uh figure it out uh so that is disproven right there kids now on the honor roll in college uh don't think that the average 12 year old got that pin codes were years away uh the other things that happened in this movie also very futuristic hacking the other ship's control panel from the enterprise was anything but dumb and granted his monumental ego and sense of innate superiority cloud his judgment to the point where he's easily duped and goaded into chasing kirk into a nebula where he loses most of his advantage but uh, he still had a lot to work with. Like Kirk and Bones, he gets tossed the idiot ball and never once demonstrates any real smarts. This was not- 
we can see that Khan's emotion is taking over, and this is something they only spent 15 years setting up over the course of two independent stories that they linked together with this movie. They got Space Seed in 1967 or 68, and we've got Wrath of Khan in 1982. We have spent plenty of time considering what's going on with Khan. We have seen the rerun of the episode over and over. We know if he gets too pissed, his brain is almost useless to him. Whereas Captain Kirk, who is an average human for the 23rd century, an average-ish human for the 23rd century, who they're a little more evolved than us and they're a little more reasonable and smarter than us, he's able to kind of outperform Khan because he's calmer. It turns out that the augment idea wasn't the greatest uh, idea, and that's why it was abandoned and made illegal. Not always the case. In one of the scripts from which the final film screenplay was built, and before his beloved wife was fridged, there was a dialogue that indicated Khan was indeed an extra special super genius. Khan. You know why they cut that? Because it's redundant. They had already called him a genius over and over. He had to be a genius of geniuses. I mean, they already said he was smarter than anyone else. And if you saw the episode Space Seed, which is part of this story, you would know that he could read on God mode and has photographic memory. Um, how are system controls working? MacGyver's. Very well. Command and remote functions are all tied through computer stations. How could you have designed it so quickly? Con. You know, the idea that they redrafted the script and eliminated some characters is being held over the heads of the writers like they're horrible people. You know, taking a few characters out of your narrative if it's too busy can only help. We've seen this before in Star Trek. Even though we liked Tasha Yar, Denise Crosby felt that she was kind of stuck in the show in a rut and that there was nothing going on because there were just too many characters to juggle. So she herself made the decision to leave. And we can see that things did start to get a little bit better for the other characters after that with not so much to juggle. And then we bring back Denise Crosby in a really, really interesting way. This but is a instead, sister ship of the Enterprise. The Enterprise's manuals I absorbed for... Right. Okay. Now they're actually going to go and hammer home a point that uh, I like to make that Khan does have a photographic memory. So they're backing me up here. 14 years ago are still fresh in my mind. Not only. It was 15. Only would such a dialogue have demonstrated that Khan's an actual smarty pants, ergo a real threat. It would have made clear how 14 supermen could have run an entire spaceship. As you know what? It's ridiculous to me that they would say they needed to say this again when we have hit the idea that Khan is a genius in this movie a bunch of times. Especially it shows how little they trust their audience. It shows how dumb their writing is. In their version of Wrath of Khan, they would have reminded you in every single sentence that he was a genius. With 10 of them on the bridge. Number six, Wiley Chekhov. In old cartoons, characters would frequently run the same path of a steamroller about to flatten them, or... So this is what we're doing to our pal Chekhov here. Stand by dumbly before getting clobbered by a car or flattened by a boulder. Chekhov... Wow. Just so mean. Chekhov effectively does this on Steady Alpha 5 upon seeing the belt buckle. Chekhov. Botany Bay. Botany Bay? Oh no, we've got to get out of here now. Damn! He knows... He put it together pretty quick if you ask me, considering that at the time of the episode, if he was on the Enterprise, which we can assume he was, because Khan recognizes him most likely from the ship's manifest that we saw him reading on God mode. Um, you know what? Uh, Chekhov, decent call. He knows what this means, but instead of doing the logical thing, putting his helmet on and calling for extraction, assuming he even needs a helmet to do this, he and Terrell put on their helmets, step outside, and at the sight of the 14 survivors, freeze like a bug-eyed Wiley Coyote watching. There we go. We're going to mock Chekhov again. Let's just get something straight here. Chekhov didn't do anything wrong, and just because they want to compare him to Wiley Coyote doesn't make Chekhov dumb. Is he as smart as Sulu? No. Is he an intellectual match for these people on the SETI Alpha 5? No. But here's something that maybe we should remember. Um, Chekhov only sees 14 of these people. We don't know there aren't more. That's right. I'm using new track logic to debunk a new track argument. We see 14 of them, but how do we know there isn't another hut just out of sight? There seem to be more than 14 of them because they have no problem operating 
the Reliant, which is a much smaller ship than the Enterprise. It's just armed up pretty good and gets in the first shot in its attack run. King as a train bears down on him. By rights, Chekhov should have tried calling the ship before stepping outside. You don't stop to explain when you realize you're standing over a live grenade. You run, duck, or throw yourself on it. And I have a funny feeling you would throw the person next to you on it, Beecher. Beecher, please. This is a lame excuse to go for uh, the throat on someone uh, that Star Trek fans love. And we love them in Babylon 5 too. Walter Koenig, he was never given the kind of uh, opportunities other people had from Star Trek because he was typecast in the role and he didn't have the kind of fame that William Shatner had. And uh, I think we all love Chekhov. And to go after him like this, Chekhov, a man whose life has had its own personal tragedies, a man who works hard for very good causes, and a man who's been a voice for people who have uh, depression and mental illness because he lost his son to it. Uh, this is a terrible, terrible low roading of a great, great actor. Even if for some plot convenient reason, the comm didn't work inside the cargo containers, Chekhov should have been screaming for a beam out throughout their exit from the hatch and even as Khan's people moved towards them. But from the- Uh, you know, you just answered your own question there. Could have been that the communications devices did not work within the cargo container, which would have made sense. The lack of alarm exhibited by Beach and Kyle on the Reliant, it's obvious no communication of any sort was received. One can excuse- they had beamed down into an area with like really hostile uh, environment and it was probably hostile to communications. It's, it's not surprising. They were having problems getting readings off that planet the whole movie uh, as far as the ship that was there looking to use it as a Genesis test site. Check off behavior after he gets an eel in the ear, but not his costly ineptitude at this stage in the story. <sighs> it's no wonder. Let's look at some of these comments. This just made me want to watch the movie again. Have to mention, I saw this in 1982 with a very lively audience. When Spock was dying, you would have thought family members were with witnessing the death of a grand patriarch. If a fire broke out in the theater, you could have extinguished it with tears. People were consoling each other in the lobby. It tells you the power and charisma of Leonard Nimoy's Spock to... Uh, conveyed to Star Trek fans. It was a beautiful thing. I agree. I agree with this guy. All right, so let's hear the rest of these laws. Wonder he never made Captain. Number five, Universal Armageddon, but no rush, as David Marcus... Fr okay, David Marcus will pay the ultimate price for creating the Genesis device in the next movie, but let's find out. That's, as the Genesis proposal demonstrates, and as Spock and Bones' argument makes clear, the Genesis device has the potential to be a dreadful weapon if used where life already exists. We're now, when they show us how the Genesis talking weapon about Universal works, Armageddon. they give us only the slightest indication of it. Uh, they only show us the beginning of the Genesis effect. If they wanted us to be engaged, they could have shown us more of the Genesis effect, which was the first fully CGI sequence in any movie, as far as I know. Uh, there had been some use of computer-generated images before, but we're talking things like the telemetry of the ship on the uh, Discovery in 2001, a space odyssey when we would see their own computer readouts or when we would see text on screen on a word processor that was part of the actual movie. Those are still computer generated images, according to some matrixes. This is the first real CGI as we know it in this movie, but they skip over it just to trash the movie and the actors. Bones exclaims, in short, Genesis is a Manhattan. Yep, see, that's all they show you. Project. And Kirk clearly knows what it is before revealing it to his confidants. It's not a Manhattan project. Uh, and even if it was, the Manhattan Project ended the largest conflict in the history of mankind and was in the end a good thing. The people who dropped the atomic bomb are now considered heroes in the cities they dropped it on for their bravery and for freeing the people there from the imperial government that was costing them so much. The people who were in the target areas of the Manhattan Project devices were dropped leaflets and kept from leaving by their own government. So let's just think about how this was maybe a very powerful device, but there was nothing but principled uses for it unless you wanted to, as David Marcus says, pervert it into a terrible weapon. So why is it then that everyone's so damn blasé about Carol's cry for help? Consider okay, that's a lie, because as soon as Carol makes a cry for help, they set out there immediately. 
through this. Carol calls Kirk to ask if he gave the order and states that someone is going to take Genesis without proper authorization. Mid conversation, her transmission is jammed. No, mid conversation, her transmission is cut off completely. Throughout the entire conversation, there is a pronounced inability to communicate, and no one can really hear what the other one is saying. Kirk is getting a one way transmission from Marcus. He's trying to respond, but there's too much interference. Even Lieutenant Uhura can't fix it. Damn to the source. This isn't garbled communications. It's deliberate. Kirk calls Starfleet Command to try and get to the bottom of things. And when he clearly doesn't get an answer to what's going on, instead of, you know, immediately calling to the bridge and ordering maximum warp to regular one, he meanders. Meanders. The Spock's quarters for a friendly chat, and then finally goes up to the bridge to order Sulu to go to warp five. Warp. All right, listen. Regular one can't be too far away because they're the only ship in the area. Warp five is more than half of the speed the Enterprise can muster. So they're going there at 60% maximum speed. That's like saying if you're in a Camaro and you can go 120 miles an hour, you're going 80. This is not taking your time, but let's see how they justify it. Five. Yes, it's a minor continuity point, but in the previous film, the Enterprise zipped along to meet Veter at warp seven without even breaking a sweat. Warp five is like a police car driving below the speed limit while rushing to- Veter had the potential to destroy the entire Sol system. It was coming straight for Earth. They were the only ones who could stop it, and they did break a sweat. This is an outright lie. They almost destroyed the ship by going so fast within the solar system and by not taking more time to test out the engines. They create an artificial wormhole and almost destroy their ship. This detail from Trek Core, Trek, I'm sorry, Trek Culture is an outright lie. To an active crime scene. Kirk ought to have been court martialed for that. I mean, come on. For trying to save people and only going 80 of 120 miles an hour. Okay. Take things seriously, Admiral. As scripted, this would have... He's taking things seriously. It's only a garbled communication, and he's heading there pretty damn fast. Been a better scene, as Kirk would have gone to the bridge prior to him going to see Spock. This was, however, swapped around in editing for dramatic effect, but... At no, it was swapped around in editing because it makes more sense to relieve your friend of command than to simply be in the chair when they show up on the bridge. What's their next dumb point? Eel. The influence of the baby eels is pretty shaky. How is it that Terrell and Chekhov can sit by as their shipmates, Reliance crew, are marooned on Khan's barren sand heap? Yet, later in the movie, Terrell manages to resist when Khan instructs him to shoot Kirk. A man okay, I would say they're restrained by Khan's people while they're having their shipmates marooned on the planet, and it takes a little bit of time for the SETI eel to really have full effect. But even if it affects them right away, the way it appears that it does, it really does it does it really matter? when they don't have the advantage anymore they've been taken prisoner so to say they sit around say what it is how do they not affect a miraculous escape against these superhumans five times their strength ridiculous just ridiculous and he says he'd never met is kirk really just that awesome eh, rank does have its you know what the fact that terrell had never met kirk is in no way ridiculous because captain terrell is just one of many many captains and captain kirk is at this point had been according to books chief of starfleet operations which means he was like the head of the whole shebang joint chiefs of staff kind of a guy when he's telling people not to quote rules and regulations to him could it be because he wrote some of these rules and regulations it's privileges i guess or is actively murdering someone just too much for even ill influence mm, no not really as he vape um okay let's hear this one Rank does have its privileges, I guess. Or... Or... Is actively murdering someone just too much for even ill influence. Mm -hmm. Well, he does kill David Marcus's friend No, right not here. really, as he vaporizes an innocent civilian just moments earlier. Hey. He was shooting at the person charging him, but okay, let's just miscategorize everything. Then... We don't know, by the way, what stage two of being uh, infested with a SETI eel is. It could be that you become lucid all at once. Khan says stage one just has uh, suggestibility, and he says madness follows. Well, I would say that what we see next is the act of madman. After Terrell phasers himself out of the narrative rather than Kirk, why is it that the eel in Chekhov's noggin chooses that person? Not too many people would argue with me when I say that The Wrath of Khan is the best Star Trek movie ever, but it's imperfect in the way that most human endeavors are. This is unsurprising. 
Can you believe this stuff? I don't know what to tell you. Chekhov is being done dirty here. Spock is being done dirty here. When will they get around to Sulu? We've just seen that Captain Terrell was doing things that lined up with what Khan said. He said that first you're suggestible, then you go Every mad. eye, sometimes a film really ought to just make a tiny bit of effort to make clear how something improbable happens to happen. Case in point, when the Enterprise first arrives at Regula 1, Spock, Regula is a class D. It consists of various unremarkable ores, essentially a great rock in Yeah, all right, so what? Base, Kirk, Reliant could be hiding behind that rock. Spock, a distinct possibility. All right, so they're ready for it. What are you trying to say, lady? Then, in a classic case of technology doing whatever the plot requires at any given moment, when Kirk returns to the ship from the Genesis cave, he orders tactical, and immediately a computer graphic shows him exactly where the Reliant is. Or it could be an approximation. Peacher, please. Orbiting opposite them, presumably having just left the regular one station where we saw her seconds earlier. Now how- It's not like he ever lost track of the ship to begin with. He had a pretty good idea where it was. And as he had more time and gathered more information, he was able to get an idea of where the ship could be. Could what we see on tactical be a cone of certainty where we know it's within that area? It would have to be because they can't see it anywhere else and they know it didn't warp away. Could they be tracking neutrinos? Could they be using battle damage to track it? There's a whole bunch of in-world explanations this show didn't need to get into. It was obvious at this point that we're in the middle of one of the greatest sci-fi movies of all time to everyone. But this chick here, what's your problem? Feature, please. How come they couldn't do that before? And how can they track her through an entire planetoid now? And why does it only work one way? Why? How about they drop the satellite and no one else noticed it? And Isn't Khan all? There she is. At the same instant, Kirk spots where the Reliant is. And just how long has the Enterprise crew known where Reliant is? Is I, I, I can't believe that I'm sitting here defending Wrath of Khan from some sort of Trek culture website that claims claims to be pro Star Trek. This is pro New Trek. This is not Star Trek. This is an attack on Star Trek. This how she's managed to stay out of sight? If you can't tell, I have a lot of questions. One can speculate or manufacture all sorts of rationalizations for this, like how the Enterprise was receiving telemetry from Regular One that Khan didn't know how to access, but then it gives Exactly. You're answering your own questions again. This is not very good propaganda. Kirk an easy advantage instead of showing him using his smarts or his experience as a starship captain. Taking obstacles away from the protagonist diminishes his efforts. It could... I think when he fooled him by talking in code and then figured out that he had only two-dimensional thinking by talking to his own people who had friendship and loyalty and were willing to sacrifice for Kirk, that's what put Kirk over the top. The problem with Khan is that all his people are loyal to him, but they are yes men who will not take any initiative. They wait for him to tell them what to do. In Starfleet, we have some autonomy, and we're going to see some from Spock at the end of this movie, something that uh, this video, I'm sure, will give short trip to. Could easily have been addressed by simply mentioning sensor damage earlier in the damage report, or by having regular one telemetry appear on the tactical display. But alas, they didn't. Number two, damage. Now, you've just answered your own question in a way that makes sense. That's an in-world explanation. Uh, and you're not saying that it needed to be in the movie. So what are you saying? Peculiar. Starfleet surely knows that the Reliant is assigned to Project Genesis. So when Kirk calls them concerning Carol's cry for help, the very first order of business should have been to call the Reliant and ask what's going on or if they... All right. We already know that if they call the Reliant, they're not going to answer or they're going to get a fake answer. We've got some Starfleet double agents on there. We know anything about it. Nothing in the film suggests that a call like this happened, or if it did, that Starfleet ever got back to Kirk about whether they could or couldn't get through. And furthermore, despite being told they are, as usual, the only ship in the quadrant, they spot the Reliant assigned to Genesis not only in their quadrant, but closing fast. And By the way, they, uh... They, they, they just blow off a few things here that are just simply true about the movie. Like, although the Reliance is in the quadrant, it's coming back unexpectedly and has a head start. They don't call the people on the uh, space station the first moment they can. The first moment they can. They call them at the moment of their choosing. They are setting up a battle with Kirk. They're looking to fight Kirk. Khan wants to delete Captain, I'm sorry, Admiral 
Kirk. As soon as Kirk calms the bridge, he is ordering to try the emergency channels. So if something is already odd, the moment Spock deduces there's something weird about Reliance excuse about their chamber's coil is overloading their comm systems, that ought to have been the last straw, but it was Kirk is overconfident here for a couple of reasons, and uh, we can't really say anything except that he trusted other Federation vessels. Yes, he made a mistake. Kirk made a mistake. Oh my god. Awesome. Now, from Carol's message earlier, Kirk knows that A, someone is trying to take Genesis. Right, okay, so what? B, that Carol believes it's someone from Starfleet, as she said, did you give that order? And S All right, so if he believes one and two, that means he should attack other Starfleet vessels? B, her transmission gets jammed at the source. So, when the Reliance- He's, This is still too much to ask from anyone. The jammed the source was pop possibly a poor choice in dialogue. Block at the source would have left a better ambiguity. But you know what? This is really serious nitpicking. These are not dumb things. These are small inconsistencies in the script or totally fabricated lies. It shows up acting damn peculiar. Even too long out of pasture Kirk should have been able to put two and two together and acted with due caution. Yeah, I know the point of Wrath of Khan is that Kirk is rusty, but given everything leading up to the moment of the ambush, his hesitation and inaction serves to not merely... I... He's not that rusty. They portray Kirk as out of practice, but as an incompetent fool, responsible for the loss of Genesis and the Enterprise damage and casualties. All right. If he'd been an incompetent fool, he would not have realized he made a mistake, adjusted his tactics, and won the day. He made a mistake. He made a tactical error. He got jacked by a ship in his own fleet. He had no reason to believe there was anything up. And he ends up winning that engagement. That's almost dumb enough to warrant being drummed out of the service. Number one, the Genesis. This is the second time she said the greatest captain in Starfleet history should have been kicked out of Starfleet. Effect. Even taking the movie on its own terms, that the Genesis planet even exists at the end is beyond absurd. The narrative makes it abundantly clear that... Feature, please. They're in a stellar nursery. The Genesis device is intended to be employed on an existing solid body. Why else would the Reliant be scouring space for suitable sites? Carol, stage three will involve... All right, so the nebula formed a planet. I mean, it made sense to me right there in the movie theater. The process on a planetary scale, it is our intention to induce the Genesis device into the pre-selected area of a lifeless space body, a moon, or other dead form. Yet, as the story climaxes, the Genesis device goes off inside the Reliant, which is itself within the Matara Nebula, and... We're just going to skip over Spock's sacrifice here. We're just going to skip right over it somehow, the Genesis wave not only turns the entire nebulous gas and dust into some different kind of matter, complete with all sorts of plant DNA, but all of this conveniently falls together into a sphere in a matter of minutes. The icing on the cake, though, is that this preposterous planet just so happened to have formed within- Proto-matter. Proto-matter, not even once. Stay away from the proto-matter. There's an explanation in the next movie. In the Goldilocks zone of a star. Star, wait, where did that star come from? We're in a nebula. Nebulas are stellar nurseries much of the time. Was it the one regular orbits, or did Genesis manufacture a star too? And how does that miracle planet just happen to have exactly the right angular momentum to go into orbit around that wherever it's from? There are many nebulas with stars inside of them. From star? Ugh, and some fans complain that the red matter in Star Trek 2009 was dumb, but play by- The red matter in, st in Star Trek 2009 wasn't just dumb and convenient. It was an outright insult. But look what they're trying to do here. They're trying to rescue Bad Trek at the expense of the good. Your own rules movie. And those were the 10 dumbest things in Star Trek 2, The Wrath of Khan. Do you think we missed something? Well, check. Yeah, I think you missed fucking watching the goddamn movie in good faith. Got the article on our website because there's four additional dumb things listed there. Oh, and before I get any pitchforks in the comments. I'll spare you the pitchforks in the comments. Beat your please. Fuck you. This is genuinely my favorite Star Trek movie, and I've watched it way more times than I can count, but... Yeah, it sure sounds that way. You sound like you're just way head over heels in love with this movie after the way you just took a hatchet to it and called Captain Kirk an incompetent, what, three times, twice? There's just something fun about taking a look at the media that we love and just tearing it apart. If you like this video... So then you must love what I do with New Trek then. Video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't, make sure you let me know in the comment section below how much you dislike it. If you want to keep up to date with us, you can give us a follow on various social medias at Trek. And no one cares. This video has 9.2 thousand thumbs up and 634 thumbs down. Now, 635. Wow. You can see from the comments here, um, people are disagreeing. 
Khan is intellectually strong. He's from the, a man from the 1990s. He's only other, ever been on one other 23rd century vessel. Also, uh, the line that we heard in here about how uh, he has everything memorized from the tech manual 15 years ago, while it supports that he would know who Chekhov was, uh, we find out that even Captain Kirk, who's been on that ship the whole time, didn't know how to operate the redesigned Enterprise after the refit. So if you're saying cutting that line was wrong, I mean, I would encourage you to watch more than just one Star Trek movie. This was a terrible case of New Trek gaslighting. These people are lying to us, and they're tearing down the old Star Trek we love to try to make their new horrible Star Trek look better. Well, we're not going to take it, and we're not going to fall for it. We're a lot smarter than that. You're going to have to attack us with something with a little more intelligence than that angle. She was attacked by what appears to be essentially a robot. Yeah, essentially. And I would like to know what these people were on when they wrote this stupid takedown of one of the greatest movies of all time. Pure anti-proton. Absolutely pure. <laughs> Sounds likely. I mean, there are so many great moments in this movie. Just think of them. I'm a bloodsucker. You're going to have to do your own dirty work now. Do you hear me? Do you? still alive my old friend still old friend that used to be how star trek went all the time it was always good it was almost always well written it was very inventive it was entertaining it was friendship loyalty and sacrifice at the final frontier it mostly made sense almost all the time and now we have these angle biters attacking real Star Trek, real great stories that brought people together and made them think to excuse this horrible garbage with strange new worlds. Well, we have a couple of days left where we can have some Star Trek dignity before the strange new worlds musical episode. And I'll be digging into that. Believe me, you. Until then, this has been me, your buddy, Admiral Teague. And... I am stronger with you than without you. Please hit those like and follow buttons. I need your help so I can spread the word. I'm ready to get out of here now. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Admiral Teague. It's been my pleasure to address you about this terrible Star Trek attack and this anti-Star Trek propaganda. This concludes this presentation.